Hello everyone, my name is Achyut. I'm a faculty here at the Fortune Eyes Academy. Um, here, we are today to discuss about the second test series. Uh, the test series conducted by both the Fortune Eyes Academy in Trivandrum and IAS Hub in Delhi. So, the second test of the entire prelims test series uh, was based on the syllabus of ancient India and art and culture along with the current affairs and the respective Yojana position. So, we will be starting with the discussion of the current affairs as well as the art and culture sections. Yes, uh, with this we will going direct to the discussion of the art and culture and the current affairs as well as the Yojana and Kurukshetra positions. Okay, so we will be discussing the question papers uh, in the random order according to the uh, art and culture as well as the current affairs and the Yojana portion. Okay, so here is the first question. The first question is about a prehistoric painting. Uh, this, all the statements, uh, there are three statements given in the question and the question asks is whether well, which is the right statement. The first statement is about the, there is a great variety of themes found in the cave paintings of the Central Asia. Second, with the progression of time to Mesolithic period, the themes of the paintings actually uh, grew larger in size as well as it varies. Third number three states the hunting scenes is a major predominant theme in the Mesolithic period. See, uh, in art and culture, we have a couple of areas, couple of themes where we will be focusing on. One of the theme in the art and culture is actually regarding paintings. Uh, you know, paintings, we have classified paintings into various types. Even according to the periods, we can classify paintings, be it the ancient painting, be it the medieval painting. And it always starts from the prehistoric painting. The very important, very famous prehistoric painting is found in the Madhya Pradesh uh, is the Bimbetka cave paintings. So, it is with respect to the Bimbetka cave paintings, we know uh, what all kind, what all themes are present in the paintings and what all varieties and the time period of the paintings and all. Here, the question says that there is a great variety of themes in the cave paintings in the uh, particular in the central India, which is actually correct. We have a lot of themes like a hunt, majorly it is hunting scenes along with we have uh, the animal figures, unknown animal figures, processions of the people as well as the animals, uh, the uh, um, undescribed images and all. So there are different types of uh, paintings, themes can be found in Central India uh, during this particular period. What about the year? Yeah, which makes the actually the third statement also correct because hunting scene and the use of weapons and killing of animals and all is actually the main uh, broad theme uh, of the painting of that particular prehistoric era which makes the statement 1 and statement 2 correct, statement 3 correct. What about statement 2? Say that the theme multiplies which is true. The theme actually multiplies. There are a lot of themes when it comes to from the Palo upper Paleolithic period to the Mesolithic period. But what about its size? The size of the paintings is not larger. It became uh, diminishing. Uh, the size of the paintings start diminishing. It became smaller and it became more realistic. Uh, the, it was the initial type of painting was basically a rudimentary painting. So uh, the there was no correct proportion of the paintings with regard to the original subjects and all. But when the as the period moves on, there is a decrease in the size of the painting. So the statement number two says that there is an increase, which made the statement wrong. So the answer of the question is C, one and three only. Moving to the question number three, is about Indus Valley civilization, and it's all, oh, the question is about in the art and culture part. It's about its sculptures of the Indus Valley civilization. We have the state number one say the Harappan use lost wax technique to make bronze statues. There is a presence of bronze statues of humans as well as animals. Second statement. Third statement says that there seems to be decline in this art over the time and late harpen sites and lack metal cast sculptures. See, uh, again, another, as I said, like, as the, as the paintings we have in art and culture, the another theme of art and culture we are dealing with is actually sculptures. In sculptures, we have, we are starting with the sculptures of prehistoric, we have the Indus Valley sculptures, we have the ancient period sculptures, for example, for the Mauryan period, we have the Yakshi Yakshini worship, where we have the Didargan Yakshi as a sculpture, we move into the Gupta period, we have uh, more and more sculptures, in between the post Mauryan period, we have the three schools, the Gantara school, the Amravati, as well as the Madhura School of Arts, three Buddhist School of Arts 
and later when it comes even to the uh, medieval as well as later in the south in kingdom we have the chola sculptural forms so as a whole in alternate culture sculptures can be divided into various according to the period here the question is asked about the indus valley sculpture the first statement says that we have uh, the bronze metal sculptures yes the bronze statues in the indus valley is actually made using the technique called lost wax technique which is also known as sire perdu in french and in the harappan sites across all the period in all the harappan sites be the early be the late or be the uh, middle harappan period we can see the bronze images particularly using the lost wax technique one of this is only uh, technique used for lost wax technique used for the uh, uh, bronze statue casting and all so lost wax technique was used in indus valley throughout in various part of the indus valley even the late harappan sites because we have an evidence of uh, bronze statues made using this particular technique in the daimabad which is in gujarat so which is a late harappan site actually so we have uh, late harappan sites where we have techniques of statue sculptures that uses the lost wax techniques too and there is also the presence of the lost wax technique uh, images or the um, statues of both men and humans and animals the most important lost wax technique is a prized uh, moment or the prized statue of the dancing girl of the mohenjadaro as well as we found even from the same same site we found bronze images of the uh, particular bronze statues of the bull so we can see that both the human as well as the animal figures can be found from the particular indus valley civilization which makes the answer uh, one and two only because the statement three says that there is a decline in the art over this time and the late harappan sites lack metal sculpture which is actually false which we uh, proved using the evidence of the uh, bronze statues in uh, daimabad which is a late harappan site so which make the uh, answer of the question number three a one and two only fourth question is about uh, it's uh, it's a different type of question because upsc tends to ask such type of questions giving clues and you have to identify what kind of site or what kind of painting is it okay oh, the case the first statement given here is the uh, is about it is about a cave okay so the first statement is cave here have the painting ranging from the second century bc to fifth century ce and the themes of the painting are majorly buddhist in nature and the important paintings of this particular cave is Patma Pani and Vajra Pani paintings. So, in order to, is, there are a lot of four options given about the different type of caves, and you have to identify the cave using the clues given above. The, the a very easy question. UPSC tend to ask, and you ask this question, particular question back in the uh, uh, this year's films itself about the Patma Pani paintings. The painting and the cave mentioned here is the Ajanta case. Uh, all these clues are uh, particularly focused on the Ajanta cave because Ajanta. Uh, is actually uh, patronized by two dynasties both the satavahana dynasties and the vakataka dynasties satavahana is actually focused on the hinayana buddhism where there is only symbols so uh, and there comes the vakataka dynasty in the later phase we have the mahayana buddhism where you can see the enormous kind of paintings in the uh, ajanta cave so it majorly has the buddhist kind of paintings with two kind of structures or two kind of uh, dynasties that are ruling over the two kind of paintings that are ruling over the uh, across the agenda. So we have the important painting. The cave number one contains the paintings of the Padma Pani and the Vajra Pani. One of the most important cave in the agenda cave as well as it is also the one of the important painting. See, remember that UPSC asked this question in the previous prelims. 2018 prelims got a question from the Padma Pani paintings belongs to which cave? Here we are giving a clue. And identifying the cave so which make the answer to the fourth question be agenda caves first question is about a current affairs question actually we have mixed the questions uh, into actually current affairs the ancient India as well as the art culture we have mixed the question in order to get the feel of the UPSC pattern so here comes the current affairs question which uh, is that is uh, which among the following organizations make recommendation for fixing minimum support price for the agriculture product minimum support price fix uh, which of the recommendations committee which recommend the minimum support see you have to understand there is two committee associated with uh, the minimum sub support price the first committee is actually the commission for agriculture cost and prices which actually recommended the mini the msp and 
the committee, the cabinet committee on economic affairs is the committee that approves the MSP. So there are two committees associated with the MSP. The committee which recommends the MSP is the Commission uh, for the Agriculture Cost and Prices and the committee which finalizes or approves the MSP is the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. Here the question is asked which organization makes recommendations which make the answer as B, the Commission of Agriculture Cost and Prices. Very easy question, very direct question because there was an announcement uh, about in the budget on the MSP, the high in the MSP. Sixth question, uh, we are again dealing with the art and culture section. Again, is about a cultural contribution. The type of uh, type of uh, part, uh, every city has got some more speciality. Especially after the Mauryas, uh, we have uh, we have the post Mauryan dynasty like the Shakas, we have the Shunkas, we have the Satavahanas and all. See, all these dynasty establish or flourish based on the uh, the contacts made during the uh, Mauryan period as well as during the Persian and Greek invasion. With the pa Persian as well as the Greek invasion, we have uh, developed a lot of cultural contacts between uh, both the India in the West Asia as well as India and the European part of the uh, globe. So we have contributions, we have the trade going on tremendously regarding the, uh, the part of the uh, during that kind of period. So. The focus is the questions of was on direct questions from the NCRT say that Sataka. Sataka is actually a cloth, the name of a cloth, the cloth type is famous in which of the following city. See, every city in the ancient part has got a, its own speciality. Every city in the ancient part has got its own speciality. Sataka actually is a type of cloth. Sataka is actually from the city of Madure. Shataka is a cloth that is very famous of Madure and the type of Shataka clothes are uh, used for trade and was uh, one of the important revenue sources of the, uh, the dynasties existing over there. This is the sixth question which makes the answer as uh, A. Madure. Yes, seventh question is about Rashtra Kuda dynasty. Again, uh, uh, particularly the contribution of the dynasties, Rashtra you do have to know when the Rashtra dynasty actually appears. Uh, we have a section called the post Mauryan sections, where we have uh, what kind of uh, dynasties are coming. It is important to understand the chronology of the ancient Indian part. When it starts with the, we are starting with the Mauryas, we have the post Mauryan dynasties, we have the Guptan dynasty, we have the Post-Guptan dynasties. See, you have to understand which all, which all, you have to understand which all dynasties are coming in particular period. So the important dynasties at this period are actually uh, one of the important dynasties, the Rashtrakuta dynasty. Rashtrakutas. Rashtrakutas. Rashtrakuta dynasty and it's a question here is asked about the Rashtrakuta dynasty and its contribution in literature. Uh, after the Guptas, the Sanskrit literature begins to actually grow across the India. And after the Guptas came, uh, a prom, one of the prominent dynasty was the Rashtrakuta dynasty along with the Vakataka dynasty. The Rashtrakuta dynasty actually patronized uh, the Sanskrit literature which had flourished during the time of the Guptan period. They even uh, helped in the growth of the local Kannada literature where they have a lot of important poets coming up during this period. The poets like Pampa, Ponya all came up together and uh, even translated the important Sanskrit works into the Kannada language which helped the language to flourish during this particular period. Yes, the question here is asked about Rashtra Kuda's patronage Sanskrit literature, which is actually correct. It was actually a continuation of the Guptan dynasty that again they patronized Sanskrit literature. And the Jain literature flourished during this, under this period, which is also true actually. The Jain literature under the Rashtra Kuda flourished a lot. And we have even the Jain scholars. We have a lot of Jain scholars coming up in the particular Rashtra Kuda periods. We have like we have like a people like Amoka Varsha. Amoka Varsha who wrote the Kavi Raja Marga. Kavi Raja Marga written by Amoka Varsha uh, is one of the important pieces in the Jain literature sections. So we have uh, even the Jain literature along with flourishing with the Sanskrit literature and the same Sanskrit literature and the Jain books are getting converted to the Kannada literature. You With the advent of the new 
uh, poets. For example, as I said before, like poets like Pampa. Pampa, we have Ponna. We have poets like Pampa and Ponna in the Kannada literature. They have flourished, they have used the same kind of Jain literature in order to convert to the uh, particular uh, Kannada literature. So, all the statements given in this uh, seventh question are correct. This is about the question was about the literary contributions or literatures in sections of the Rashtrakuta dynasties. Next question is the eighth question. It's about again the horticulture part, it's again from the architectural areas. We have architecture, another subsection of the art and culture. We have the architecture. Or in architecture, the question is which form of the architecture was followed by the Chalukya or the Badami for the structural temples? It's a very easy question because uh, uh, basically when we are dealing with the architecture sections, we have classified architecture into various types because we have the ancient architecture where we even classify it into the temple architecture, the cave architecture and all. Under the temple architecture, the question is also about specifically about the Chalukya or the Badami. So the Chalukyas of Badami actually were in the middle part of the country. We have the India, we have the Chalukyas over here. The Chalukyas of Badami being in the Karnataka as well as the Central India form the particular Vezara type of temples. Vezara type of temples. Vezara type is actually the mix of both the Nagara, the North Indian type of the temples and Dravida, the South Indian type of temples. So the Chalukyas of Badami actually focused on Vezara type of temples which make the question very easy because it was, a, it was a direct factual question regarding it which make the question number A answer as C Vezara type. Twenth question is again about architecture. We talk about the architecture uh, this question but focus on a different dynasty. It's about the Guptan temples. We have temples we even classify the particular north uh, Indian Nagara type of temples according to various dynasties. But we in the Guptan temples we can see the, the during the last phase of the Guptan kind of temples we can see the proper emergence of the Nagara type of temples and one of the uh, prime example of the late Guptan period temple is actually the Dashavatara Vishnu temple. Dashavatara Vishnu temple at the So these are uh, uh, these are the variations you can see because according to various periods of the Gupta we have stage 1 Gupta temples which is very rudimentary type of temples, stage 2 Gupta temples little bit more developed temples but the third stage three temples we even have the proper superstructure type of temples that is one kind of temple is that called the Dashavatara Vishnu temple in Diyogar which is in the Uttar Pradesh again, again a, a direct question about the temple and its aggregation uh, and the, a, a, about almost its dynasty or, or its period which is the late Guptan period of of temples so the answer for the tenth question is uh, option number C, which makes the Deshavatara type of temples. Next question is about uh, the puppetry forms of India, uh, which the uh, the question number 11 asks about with reference to the art of puppetry in India, consider the following statements. It says that the Narthi Shastra, the masterly treatise on dramaturgy attributed to the sage of Bharata Muni, uh, uh, which refers to the art of puppetry. State number two says that the early reference to actually the art of puppetry is found in the Silapadigaram. So both these statements actually uh, trace to the origin of or the mention of the puppetry in the early part of the history. Uh, when you deal with the puppetry or the varieties of puppetry, you need just need to know what is the basic quality, the basic classification of the puppetries. Puppetries in India can be classified into four types. Starting with the string puppetry, we have the shadow puppetry, we have the road puppetry, and we have the glow puppetry. So uh, you at least you have to study is that like one type the puppetry type of puppetry and its few examples that is the type of questions usually upc tends to ask about puppetry and with any any type of puppetry that is in news also because something in news with related to current affairs is always important for us the here the question but is asked about the uh, traces to the origin of the puppetry it is known that Silipadi Garim contains a reference to puppetry and puppetry has very great importance in Tamil Nadu because they have the major string puppetry, uh, the Bommalattam and the Gombayatta pom is all existing in the southern part of the India. Uh, so puppetry actually traces its origin to Silipadi Garim and no to Narthi Shastra of the Bharata Muni. Narthi Shastra actually mentions about the, uh, the expressional form of art which basically deal with the origin of 
dance dance uh, it can be every indian classical dance can be traced back to natashatra but not the puppetry form which uh, makes the answer of the particular 11th question b too only because the not puppetry is always mentioned only in the no selapadigaram not in the natashatra 12th question is about a direct question the corrosion resistant iron pillar of delhi is an artistic and engineering marvel from ancient india this pillar belongs to which period again a sculpture again a question about a pillar uh, pillars in ancient india are very important because ashoka uh, being uh, uh, being the king of the uh, mauryas uh, erected a lot of pillars across the country uh, as a part of even uh, promoting his dhamma policy even marking important sites of buddhism and all and what about the the question here is about the famous iron pillar which uh, which is famous for because even with all this decades of all the centuries the particular pillar is yet to rest there is a corrosion tendency prevention tendency or corrosion prevented pillar is there and the question here is asked which of the uh, following period where the pillar is erected or you can attribute to which of the period the pillar the answer is the guptan period it is said that the chandragupta vikram chandragupta vikramaditya or chandragupta 2 is the uh, erected this particular pillar at the uh, gupta during the gupta period so it is important to understand uh, the pillars and any important inscriptions or uh, the period of the pillars again it was a very factual and dark question question number 12 answer is p yes moving to the 13th question is about classical dance another subset uh, I, i was talking about the during the art and culture part we have different subset uh, last subset we discussed was about puppetry the another subset in the art and culture is dance uh, we have dance even we classify dance into various types in india dance uh, is classified or is um, categorized into two categories mainly uh, it is the classical dance and the the folk dance so uh, the classical dances of india is very important because upsc tends to ask questions from the classical dance era here also there is another question regarding the classical dance again a similar type of question three clues are given you have to identify the dance the same number one say the archaeological evidence of the dance form is dating back to the second century found in the caves of udayagiri and kandagiri second number two state that evidence indicating continuing tradition to the dance from the second century bc and to the 10th century ce and it also follows the tenets laid down by the natashastra the dance the classical dance we are talking in about the odissi dance odissi is a dance that is mentioned clearly in the natashastra as odra magadi it is mentioned as odra magadi so which makes the shape number 3 correct so the direct clue of these all state treatments are and uh, can be attributed to the odc dance uh, we have various uh, um, uh, uh, dimensions or various features of the odc dance uh, basically when you are dealing with the classical dance you have to know the minimum content you need to know is the classical dance its, its respective state and more the features about the uh, we have more and more features about the odc dance about what kind of music are used in the particular classical dance here in odc uh, the local odc music is used as a part of the odc dance and we have different positions of the odissi dance again uh, that is an additional information you can give uh, odissi dance particularly have uh, two positions which is called chauk chauk is one of the position chauk is actually a masculine position of the odissi dance and we have the uh, the famous the tribanga posture the tribanga posture the tribanga posture so we have basically two type of stance or uh, postures in odissi dance the chauk the masculine pose as well as the tripanga the fe- feminine pose and we have different types of uh, odissi dance also odissi dance can be classified into two which first one is mahari the second one is goti pua mahari and goti pua we have two types of dance actually uh, uh, types of odissi dance existing mahari is a traditional odissi dance while goti pua is actually a somewhat bit a modern kind of uh, uh, odissi dance where boys will dress 
as girls and perform the ODC dance but which contains not the all the traditional sub bits bit of acrobatic steps in the ODC dance so these are the two types of ODC dance uh, across varieties you can see across in India so 13 question answer is D 14 is again a back to the sculpture part we have the sculptures we have the question here is the Arjuna's penance and the descent of the Ganges sculpt on the surface of huge boulders is an artistic contribution of which dynasty the the Arjuna's penance of the descent of the Ganges is actually found in the Mamalapuram at the Mamalapuram where we have the Ratha temples, the Panch Ratha temples, we have the Malapuram, which is actually the contribution of the Pallava dynasty. The Pallava king, uh, the Pallava king who actually divided, um, who defeated the uh, Chalukyan king, the Pulikeshin II. He uh, for his memory of his victory as a part of it he constructed the the descent of the Ganges of the, the Arjuna's penance where actually it was described that um, where it is story of how uh, uh, the Muni uh, the sage actually brought down the Ganges from the heaven to earth it is the process of the story of how the the sage actually called of uh, bring the Ganges from the heaven to earth it's a very beautiful structure you can see at the Mahabalipuram in Tamil Nadu. So, uh, which may be the answer of the question as B, Pallavas. 15 question, I think we have talked about the 15 question is about the uh, different type of sculptures. Because uh, sculptures is very important and in particular uh, when you are dealing with the Buddhist type of sculptures which is uh, absolutely important for the civil service part. Uh, sculptures uh, dealing with the, the next question is about the Mathura school of art. In this question paper itself, you can see actually In this question paper itself, you can actually see about Madhura school, the question from the Gantara as well as from the Amaravati. So, three major types of schools we have given in this question paper itself. Uh, question number 15 deals with the Madhura school of art. Uh, the statement number one said it was developed with the influence of the Graco roman elements in its early phase which is actually false because the Madhura school is comparatively indigenous and the first statement is about the Greco-Roman norms or the flourishing or the kind of elements was adopted by not by the Madhura school but by the Gantara school. State number two says that it's carved out images of Shiva and Vishnu which is also true because basically we are dealing saying that the um, particular schools all these three schools deal with the buddhism but here we have the madhura school that deals always also with the uh, even with the king as well as the uh, existing shaivet or vaishnavet cultures third question the female figures of yakshinis and abzaras were produced under the madhura sculpture again true not only the buddhist because it was not only limited to the buddhist subject it actually spreads out to various subjects so which makes the answer as two and three 16 question is a very interesting question because a lot of students have made this uh, made the question wrong the particular question wrong uh, because of the actually confusion persisting around the Mauryan architecture era the Mauryan architecture is a very less documented ar uh, era of architecture where we have the burn bricks were used for the first time in the northeastern India because uh, burn bricks you know burn bricks are used in the Indus valley during the Indus valley civilization and when it comes to the uh, Gangetic valley and to the upper part and of the north Bihar as well as the um, UP uh, the, for the first time it was used during the Mauryan period the burn bricks and we have the presence of we have even the presence of a uh, wooden structures mentioned in the uh, indica of the magistinus magistinus mentioned about the big 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 palaces made of wood during the in partly putra during time of mauryan period because we don't have the evidence actually of the wooden structures due to its uh, less durability so it was only due to the indica and its uh, present account says that we know about there are the present of wooden structures and big palaces during the time of mauryas and third is about it is not longer imperative to build settlements on the banks of rivers it is also correct because all the civilization all the cultures that developed during the initial phase was settled uh, around a river or a uh, place of water present of water uh, during the advent of the Mauryan period the ring wells which means you know that uh, how ring wells 
or the wells the ring wells was found the ring where the ring wells you have uh, all these uh, particular ring wells can be uh, can be made where there is presence of water so it is not only ne not necessary to be uh, near to a water source you can even construct where the water is present you can go and settle down over there so the presence of ring water and the uh, ring wells as well as the advent and the expansion of ring wells during the Mauryan period gave that Im imperative that we, you, any personality or any person should no longer be, uh, be beyond the case of the the river itself so that are the that were the three statements about this question all these statements three statements are correct which make the answer d next question is the uh, next question we are going to deal with this 21st question it's a current affairs question about uh, delhi mumbai industrial corridor the question is about which all states uh, are uh, uh, the delhi mumbai industrial corridor pass through which all states here we have given the uh, four states the up madhya pradesh haryana and gujarat See, uh, Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor actually passed through six states, but it includes Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, Gujarat, Delhi, we have the uh, Rajasthan, and we have the Maharashtra, not Madhya Pradesh. The six states are UP, Haryana, Gujarat, Delhi, Rajasthan, and Maharashtra. Madhya Pradesh, there is no Madhya Pradesh in this. Uh, Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor. So Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor does not pass through Madhya Pradesh, which makes the state number two wrong. And all the other states are uh, there are there is industrial corridor. The particular DM Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor is passing through all the other states, which makes the answer C. So uh, these are the questions. Uh, 21st question and moving quickly to the question number 37. 37 is about uh, another pillar but another pillar during the another period so we have pillars throughout the uh, modern India, medieval indian as well as we have the ancient indian time so the pillars from the ashoka is continuing or the trend of pillars is continuing uh, in various occasions so we have so we have pillars uh, the particular question is about besnagar or the or the vasudeva pillar or you you can even call this pillar as Dasnagar pillar the question here is asked, who constructed a pillar in honor of vasudeva at Dasnagar near vidisha again a pillar that is erected or constructed during the time of zunga dynasty which is a post mauryan dynasty uh, yeah, you know after the mauryas we have a uh, we have a lot of peoples coming from the uh, the central asian part starting with the indo greeks we have the sunkas we have the parthians we have the kujans and all so we have a lot of dynasties actually coming in though the sunkas were the one of the major dynasties in in the uh, um, started off with the uh, in the uh, across the india as well as they have always thrived in india after the uh, it was also the major major dynasty after the maurya so during the time of zunga dynasty there were visitors greek ambassadors who visited in india and one of such ambassador was heliodorus heliodorus actually came during into to india during the sunka period studied about vaishnavism and he was passionate about vasudeva and the concept of vaishnavism and he was a person who erected this vasudeva pillar at the best nagar or it's also known as the heliodorus pillar at the best nagar so the answer of this question is 37 is a 39 is the current affairs question. Current affairs question is again the particular question was uh, news. Uh, the scenario was in news. The topic was in news, which is rodent drones. Because during the February time, there was a news. Due, there was a news about a rodent drone national park. A rodent drone national park. A national park uh, for rodent drones in Arunachal. We have the Rodentron National Parks in Arunachal. So the question is, with reference to Rodentron species of plants in India, contain the following statements. They are confined only to the northern part of the India, especially in Himalayas. The indiscriminate fiddling coupled with the loss of habitat is seen as the biggest threat of the plants. 
uh, rhododendrons is actually con present in a uh, different part of india not only not only in himalayas on the northeast because uh, they uh, rhododendrons in northeast as well as himalayas uh, there is huge in huge number but rhododendrons are even can be found out in southern part of india especially in tamil nadu it can it is actually a scrub as well as a big tree so uh, some stage it will be scrubs according to the climatic condition the topography it will be grow as in a different manner even stage in states in the northeast as well as north have declared the rhododendrons as its state species for example himachal pradesh and nagaland have rhododendron flower as a state flower and sikkim and uttarakhand has got rhododendron as a state tree so state number one is wrong because it says that confined only to northeast no or to the himalayas which is false it is also present in south india especially in tamil nadu state number two is correct which make the answer uh, uh, the, the question actually was which of the following is not correct so the first statement is not correct and the answer is a only yes 40 question number 40 is about national commission for protection of child rights the question statement says that it is a statutory body under the administrative control of ministry of women and child development the commission's mandate is to protect the right of child defined as a person to zero to 12 years of age groups yes the actually the news uh, there was always news regarding the national commission for protection of child rights because uh, because of the uh, shelter home issues we know that the recently uh, there are uh, problems in the shelter homes where um, where the students where the uh, inhabitants are sexually harassed and the the role of the uh, the the importance of the national Protection commission was in question because they're not doing their duties or they're not in doing the right in the right manner so national commission for the protection of child rights speaks about is a statutory body under the ministry of women and child development but the age the age group defined uh, for a for a child in india is different according to different legislation and different for different commissions and all so but for national commission for protection of child rights the age is 0 to 18 not 0 to 12 you can even see that uh, there was a previous article in hindu says that uh, about the the definition of child who is a child because in india child is defined um, or child is defined as in a different age group according to different um, legislation we have the child rights uh, child uh, labor prevention act we have the child marriages act all defining child in a different age group even the juvenile justice act defining child in a very different manner but here as for the national commission for protection of child rights the group is 0 to 18 not 0 to 12 which make the same number two wrong and one correct 41st is again a Yujana Kurukshetra question is about malnourishment or malnutrition. State say that which of the following are forms of malnutrition? Child shunting, anemia in the women of the productive reproductive age, overweight in adult women. All these three are actually the forms of malnourishment or malnutrition because the malnutrition according to WHO is defined as deficiencies or excess or imbalance in the person's intake of nutrients is not really deficiency it can also be excess or imbalance of the nutrition so it is always you can even attribute the overweight as one of the reasons for anemia or overweight one of the reasons of the malnourishment so which makes the 41st question is a very easy question and all these three statements are correct 42nd question is about national food security act because the question here says that the the act provides for both food security as well as nutritional security in case of known supply of anti-terminal food grain the beneficiary will receive food security allowance third statement say that pregnant women and lactating mothers are entitled to receive maternity benefit of rupees six thousand see these are the three actually main features of the national food security act 2013 because the food security act provides for not only the food security but as well as the nutritional security minimum nutrition is guaranteed under the food security act you know that uh, the the uh, for the, under the food security act the people are entitled to receive uh, a rice at three uh, three rupees per kilogram wheat at two rupees per kilogram and co cereals at one rupee per kilograms and it is getting implemented by every different state almost all the states in india right now uh, uh, the supreme court was even actively pursuing in the center as well as all the states regarding the implementation of the food security act second statement is also correct 
in the case of non supply there is a provision of food security allowance or we have the food security elements to be given to the beneficiaries so uh, next there will be another extra quota even in the cash terms the security elements will be given if there is a case of don't supply third is important because it was a news regarding uh, the implementation of a scheme because recently the prime minister uh, recently the government announced a new scheme called pradhan mantri matru vantana yojana in order to implement the third particular statement given in the, the, the food security act giving a cash benefit to pregnant women 6000 rupees to pregnant women so the particular all these three statements given here are the statements pakka statements given the national food security act of 2013 which make the answer of the 42nd question also d next question is the 43rd question the 43rd question is uh, talking about a particular body in news the body is actually the partnership for maternal newborn and child health it is an actually a, a initiative it's a world initiative uh, again uh, the particular question was taken from the eugena uh, about the uh, newborn and the nutritional needs of the women the state number one state that it is an intergovernmental alliance of 77 countries it is not any actually an intergovernmental alliance it is an inter-organizational alliance a lot of organizations so are the members of this particular uh, initiative so more than thousand organizations are a part and it is not an intergovernmental alliance and second statement says that it was formed in 2015 to support the targets or develop these targets of the sustainable development goals which is actually not true because the particular initiative was started way back in 2005 in order for the development of millennium development goals it's not the sustainable development goals it's the mdgs millennium development goals in 2005 so again the statement number two is also wrong because it's given that it is formed during the last 2015 for sustainable development goals not for millennium development goals so it is for millennium development goals formed in 2005 third statement says that the secretariat is hosted at the world health organization and this is the only correct statement because secretariat of the particular alliance is is uh, located in at the geneva at the headquarters of the who so which make the answer actually uh, 43rd question only three and b only yes 44th question was actually i uh, was mentioning previously about the scheme during the national food security act question is the pratana mandri Matru Vantana Yojana. Pradhan Mandri Matru Vantana Yojana was actually launched in 2017 by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. This is the ministry that is implementing the particular scheme, which makes the statement number one wrong. Because other during the statement number for the other statement number one, it is given that it is implemented by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, which is wrong. Any particular government scheme, the minimum thing you need to know is the which of the which of the ministry is implementing the scheme the so, pradhan mantri matru mantana yojana enacted to implement the third provision of the food security act which is giving cash benefit to pregnant women so it is implemented not by the health ministry but by the women and child ministry and it aims to implement the provision of cash maternity benefit and i said earlier it is correct the question here asked is which of the following is not correct the statement number one is not correct so, Pradhan Matri Matru Vantana Yojana is implemented by women and child development. You have to understand. As well as there is, um, what is actually the, uh, what are the provisions of the Pradhan Matri Matru Vantana Yojana? You have to understand that uh, it is uh, according to the, the particular act. According to the particular scheme, uh, we have uh, a woman, a pregnant woman actually receives uh, uh, an amount of 6,000 rupees. An amount of 6,000 rupees. See, an average of 6,000 rupees actually is arrived. An average of 6,000 rupees is actually arrived by getting uh, initially an uh, amount of 2,000. When you are registering as a, uh, in an uncle body center for his pre-pregnancy and when you are checking up, the six months checkup at the institution, we have the 1,000. We have again the institutional delivery. We have two thousand, which makes it five thousand. And what about the remaining uh, thousand rupees? Average, according to according to another scheme that was launched way back earlier by the previous government, which is the Delhi Suraksha Yojana. 
Janani Suraksha Yojana. The, it gives that there will be 500 rupees for each birth. On an average, a person will get 1000 rupees. So, in total, there is an average of 6000 rupees you get for the uh, Pradhan Mantri Matru Vantana Yojana. And it is the same mentioned in the particular Food Security Act. So, you have to understand basically how the division will come. Uh, 5000 rupees under this particular Food Security Act, um, 1000 in overall as an average when getting from the Janini Suraksha Yojana. Okay, that's it about the question. 44th question, which makes the answer A. 45th question is an easy question food eradication process and consider the following statement it makes actually food er er eradication process is uh, a very easy process which makes the uh, slowing down the ripening or slowing down the decaying of the vegetables and fruits it uh, using the radioactive uh, uh, materials we are actually even giving it uh, a uh, protection for from uh, ripening as well as fast ripening and even decaying of the fruits and vegetables. It is one of the uh, major problems in India where the fruits and horticultures are decaying because of the very perishable commodity. We need to bring in, we need to improve its life value. So, for it, we have a food eradication process where it slows down the ripening and the aging of the fruits and vegetables. It extends the shell life of the food and destruction of microbes, which is creating food spoilage. So make, make the statement two and three correct. And statement one is wrong because it does not make food radioactive and changes its taste and temperature. Uh, there is the one any change in the taste as well as the texture of the food and the food won't be radioactive. Okay, so the statement one is wrong. 2 and 3 are correct, which make the option C. 46 question is about which of the above, below categories are categorized as waste lands in India. Slow covered uh, glacial land, degraded land under the plantation crop, shifting cultivation land, land affected by salinity or alkalinity, waterlogged and marshy land. See, uh, there was an issue about, about what are the various, what are lion, what are lands can be categorized as uh, particular waste lands but in India according to the National Waste Land Development Board we have a lot a list of categories where you can classify uh, as waste lands here all this classification all these classifications mentioned like the snow covered the degraded land as well as the shifting cultivated land the waterlogged land the marshy land all are classified as the waste land and here in the key it is given that the total number of list where uh, all these type of uh, all the type of um, lands which can be classified as the base land which make the answer again it's simple all the all the statements are all the particular land many options given are correct 47th is about Bhuvan. and Bhuvan is actually an initiative launch uh, uh, way back in 2009 it was launched by the uh, by the famous uh, yes, the reputed space agency of India, which is the ISRO. So, the, the space agency ISRO actually uh, launched this particular uh, Bhuvan. Bhuvan is actually a portal. Bhuvan of 2009 by ISRO, which makes the statement number one wrong. Because it is said here that it is a geo portal launched by the Minister of Earth Science. It is actually a geo portal, but not launched by the Minister of Earth Science, but by Ayuzaro. Bowen support the management of disasters like cyclones, flood, landslides, and earthquakes, which is actually correct. Bowen uh, was highly helpful during the, particularly during the Uttarakhand uh, uh, floods of 2013, as well as the Jammu Kashmir floods. Again, we have even in the Nepal earthquakes in 2015. Bowen actually developed by the ISRO was highly helpful for the uh, uh, for the actually management during the disasters arrangement during the disasters. Again, uh, this question asked was about the correct statement which makes it the correct statement statement number two 48 questions about the groundwater usage consider the following statement it is the largest user of groundwater in the world and the wells and tube wells are more concentrated in the water rich eastern region compared to the northern india actually 
or India is the largest excavator or the largest extractor of the groundwater. Very recently, a UNESCO report about the world groundwater situation says that India is the largest excavator of the groundwater. And it's a major problem because groundwater, uh, the resource as well as there is no proper regulation of groundwater in India. So, uh, regarding the groundwater, there is the scenario is very poor, uh, very bad in particular in the North India. Even in the South in India, we have uh, problems of the groundwater and all. So, what about second shape number two? Shape number two that the focus of groundwater, so the tube wells are already concentrated in water rich eastern part, which is actually wrong. The tube well types of irrigation of India is actually depending upon the topography of India. For example, we have the tube irrigation uh, and all in the uh, west as well as the northern part of India, not in the eastern part of India. We have the canal system in the Punjab, Haryana, and the northern areas, even in the Gujarat area, we have the canal systems and all. We have the tank irrigation system in the southern part, in the Tamil Nadu part. So the type of irrigation is actually depending on the topography of the land. So which makes the state number two is wrong because it is not only concentrated in the northeastern part or the eastern part of India, it is concentrated in the west as well as the northern part of India. So the, uh, the answer for the 48th question is one only. 49th question is again from the uh, Yujana Kurukshetra but bit on a tougher side because we have the um, data from the National Sample Survey uh, and it is directly asked. Uh, such kind of questions from reports and from surveys are asked being asked in the UPRC. So we have the first statement that the per capita serial consumption has steadily increased for both the rural and the urban population between 2001 and 11. And the infant mortality rate has witnessed a sustained reduction between 2001 and 2011. See, the National Sample Survey actually talks about the increase in the economic level, uh, increase in the income level. See, we have we can see that uh, the data from 2001 to 2011 says that we have an improvement in the income levels the per capita GDP in India is actually slowly increasing uh, but what about the nutrition level the nutrition level is actually not increasing and the consumption of the cereals and consumption of actually the uh, things are not improving are not increasing it's actually decreasing um, especially in the part of uh, yes especially in the part of um, uh, both the urban as well as the rural people both the urban and the rural have decreasing consumption between 2001 and 11 which is important point to note because even with the increasing level of income rate we don't have an increased level of consumption rate of cereals and what about the infant mortality rate which is true infant mortality rate is actually um, improving in india because 2000 between data between 2001 and 15 11 says that imr is increasing in india which made the question number 49 as b next question is the 58th question 58th question is regarding buddhist architecture the stupa architecture and it says the various components of the stupa the question here you ask is about vetika vetika is actually uh, the one of the part of the buddhist uh, architecture or the stupa part we have the stupa what is the stupa stupa is actually a mound like structure um, which is uh, where we is believed to have the relic of the buddha or its disciples so it is actually an important sport for the uh, buddhist monks and the people following the buddhism so what are the components of stupa architecture see the stupa architecture starts actually with the entrance gate which is actually uh, the gate base around the stupa structure is called the toranas the railing around the stupa is actually called the vetika so vetika is actually the railing around the stupa and we have the square fence we have the the entire semicircular space although it's uh, entire uh, 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 there is an oval shaped space which is called the the superstructure which is called the anda and over the top of anda we have actually the uh, harmika and we have uh, over the harmika we have the chatri these are the basic very basic component of the uh, particular architecture uh, of the buddha of the stupa architecture and you can easily get the image uh, it, is, it will be easy to find the image in the uh, when you search in the google regarding the stupa architecture we have a layout of the stupa architecture with focus on each of the structures we have the torana the gateway we have the vetika we have the pratikshana pathas as a circumambulatory path we have uh, even we have the uh, anda we have the harmika we have the chatri too so we have the stupa architectures and here the question was about vetika it is actually the railing which makes it option d 59 is about the alabad pillar inscription again we are dealing with the third pillar of this particular 
पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन पेपर इन सर दलहाबाद पिलर इज स्टेट अबाउट इट इज रिटर्न द क्लासिकल संस्कृत यूजिंग द नागरी स्क्रिप्ट and it gives a detailed account of the conquest of samudra gupta the author of the inscription is dandin see uh, alkhabar actually the pillar is very famous because of the uh, it contains inscription of three uh, various kings starting with the ashoka we have the ashokan inscription in the alkhabar pillar later in the gupta phase the samudra gupta inscription in the alkhabar pillar uh, and we have the in the medieval part we have the jahangir inscription in the alhabad pillar so alhabad pillar is actually known for associating with the three famous kings in the indian history uh, what about the inscriptions during the samudra gupta time it was written in the uh, proper nagari script of the sanskrit language written by hari sena not dandin so hari sena wrote a uh, uh, 33 line verse in the uh, on the uh, alhabad pillar about the samudra gupta and his conquest and all so it is not dandin dandin is actually a, a poet belongs to the pallava dynasty not about the gupta dynasty so how you can easily eliminate or easily come into the answer of this particular question is regarding uh, how, what about you know about the authors the poets or the important famous personalities in the court as well as the which period so that is how you uh, relate to the question and all so 59th is dealing with 1 and 2 only Yes, moving to the 68th question, the Banskera inscription. Banskera inscription, uh, a direct question, is actually a copper plate. Banskera copper plate inscription contains evidences and details of the ancestry or the previous um, uh, accounts of the uh, Tanisha dynasty or the Harsha Vardhana. Harsha Vardhana's uh, ancestors or the ancestral or the historical evidences of the Tanisha dynasty you can uh, see in the Banskara inscription. And how you study about the all these inscriptions and all these pillars and all these are actually the sources of the ancient India. These are the major sources of the uh, particular dynasties we can see. Uh, there are various inscriptions and various pillars you can find even with the uh on uh, the harsha vardhana dynasty itself and he even wrote literary uh, uh, evidences because we have the ratnavali the nagananda and the priya darshika all the three written by the king himself uh, which give the evidence of kind of what kind of society was there what is the history of this society and all so we have inscription we have copper inscription pillar inscription we have even the literary evidence so banskara inscription belongs to the period of harsha vardhana so 68th question is question number uh, answer is c next question is 74th question 74th question actually deals with the uh, again uh, in the, a term used in the ancient india which is sreni uh, because uh, you know uh, when you are looking at the previous year question papers uh, in particular the question from 2017 you can see the upsc has asked specific term related questions Uh, the question from 2017 was related to ancient india actually because um, you since that we we need to study about specific terms even though it is all the terms are correctly mentioned the or evidently given the ncert we use tend to skip those terms because such complex terms are there uh, these kind of terms are important because the upsc asks this type of question we can even expect questions for the upcoming exam or so the question here is shreni shreni is actually association of traders and merchants and association it even act as a uh, as an organization or a platform for people to come in and get trained about in things as well as even as a part of um, even as a part of organized trade even as as a bank for giving the short term credit to the workers in order to uh, perform their uh, and conduct the trade also so shreni is actually uh, is actually a bigger platform than uh, i'm being just an organization of traders and association direct statement paid from the ncert make the 74th question as option c 75th question this is a question i talked previously about the amravati school of art amravati school of art was developed indigenously and did not have any external influence which is actually correct because when we talked about the gantara school i talked because gantara school had the graco roman norms so which had a clear foreign influence about madura school of art which has little bit uh, mostly indigenous you can say it can mostly indigenous but coming to the amravati school of art it is fully indigenous complete indigenous school 
and what about the uh, um, arts or the type of arts in Amaravati school? Amaravati actually focused on more on the narrative side of the art. It was storytelling. Uh, there was uh, different types, even different types of materials is used in Amaravati school of art. Again, this is one uh, type we can classify three schools into being because the Gantara school uses the grey sandstone, the Mathura school uses the red sandstone, while the Amaravati school uses the white marble. So it was uh, the third segment. The second segment said about the narrative art. Third segment says about it was developed during the patronage of the Waka Takar rulers, uh, which is actually wrong because um, Waka Takar rulers were the rulers from the post Gupta night period. Vertical uh, Amravati school actually flourished during the time, initiated during the time of the Kushanas and under the patronship of Kanishka, but it was actually flourished during the Shatavasana and Ikshavaku dynasties. Both the dynasties belong to the early part of the Gupta, not in the, uh, the Gupta period, but uh, near to the end of the Mauryan period or the post Mauryan period as well as the uh, early part of the Guptan period, not in the post Guptan period, which makes the statement number three wrong. And both the uh, two other two statements are correct. About 76 question is about the Indus Valley people and it's uh, this production, the material used for the seals. Given here the materials are the steatite, the gold, iron, ivory, and agate. So it is very easy question because the Indus Valley civilization people does not possess iron because iron was not discovered during that time and it was evident that. Iron was bought by uh, even by the uh, uh, Aryans who came to invade. According to the Aryan invasion theory, they had weapons of iron, and even even after that, uh, the settlement of the uh, Indus Valley civilization and later part, the people later discovered iron and the uh, machine or the weapons using the irons, and later they were able to clear the forest to their east to their uh, to the in their friend uh, and they actually moved to the north uh, eastern part north eastern part as well as into gangetic valley and settle over there. this was actually a brief scenario a brief history about the the transition period from the Indus valley to the vedic or the later vedic phase you can say so iron was a major player but iron was not present during the Indus valley people or there are no uh, iron type of seals were present in the Indus valley civilization 76 question makes it answer B. 77th question is about UNESCO World Heritage Site. You know, uh, UNESCO is producing a, a list of World Heritage Site, and very recently we have a very new induction into the UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is the Victorian Gothic architecture in Mumbai. Um, we have the classification of uh, World Heritage Sites into you know, different parts, into the cultural, into the uh, natural, and the mixed site. We have 29 cultural sites, seven cultural, 29 natural sites seven cultural sites and we have like overall we have even one mixed site and uh, both these uh, Mahabodhi temple at the Bodh Gaya belongs to the Buddhist as well as the Rani Ki Wow in Gujarat again recently inducted into a uh, couple of years back it was inducted into the UNESCO World Heritage Site so all these uh, both these were the in the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site but what about the third the Jantar Mantar Jantar Mantar of Jaipur or the Jantar Mantar uh, actually established by the Savai Man Singh, Man Singh II of the Jaipur uh, actually he uh, established a lot of Jantar Mantars uh, an ast astronomical observatory across the country. Jantar Mantar of Jaipur is specified is included in the UNESCO World Heritage Site but here the question asks is Jantar Mantar Delhi which makes the it is wrong because 1 and 2 is correct not 3. So, uh, 77th question is Andres A. 78th question is about Tath. What is Tath? Tath is actually the classification of ragas in the North Indian type of Carnatic of music, of classical music, North Indian music. Tath is actually a classification of ragas in the Hindustani music. So, which make the answer actually a system of classification of rakas. What is the counterpart of uh, Tat in uh, Carnatic music? Mela Karta system is the counterpart of the uh, Tat in the in case of uh, the Carnatic music. So, because um, both in Hindustani as well as the Carnatic music, we have a certain kind of ragas. Uh, these ragas are actually classified into various parts. The raka is classified. The classification of raka is based on the Tat system in the Hindustani and 
according to the Mela Karta system, the Carnatic music, which make the 78th question also D. This is another subpart. I, mean, I think we have dealt with the starting with the painting, with the architecture, with the sculptures, we have the puppetry forms, we have the dance, and then now we have the music. So, see, these are the six different dimensions of the uh, art and culture area. So we have more dimensions which include the theater forms, even the arts forms and all. So we have actually, we can even round out to, there are eight subset of the art and culture sections where you can study from the NCRT and overall all the, NC, all the NCRTs. And in specifically, you have the NCRT class 11 textbooks of the art and culture, which is uh, an introduction to Indian art. Uh, which is actually a fine art book which is very useful for the as aspirants uh, uh, for the UPSC prelims. So, 78th question is regarding music and it's the answer is D. 79th question is and the rest of the remaining questions are all deal with the uh, almost de dealing with the uh, current affairs part. 79th question is about um, is about motion of tanks. Regarding the motion of tanks passed in the parliament on the president's address which of the following is not correct. Because the what is motion of tanks? According to Article uh, 87, President addresses every new Lok Sabha session as well as first session of the every year, and a motion is taken in the both the houses in order to pass this presidential address, and this presidential address motion is called motion of tanks. The motion of tanks must be passed in the parliament, else it is a failure of the government. We can usually see uh, uh, in the last couple of years, it is easily get passed in the Lok Sabha, but amended in the Rajya Sabha. Amendment is, um, is, a, is, is a technique or is a protest by the opposition parties in order to show their disagreement with certain policies. But there are some limitations to motion of tanks. The first limitation is, um, Nobody can introduce, even with the debate, during the debate of the motion of tanks, nobody can pull, uh, bring in the president's name, in, even though he is a part of the union executive. So, this is one major limitation and he cannot take upon the responsibility, uh, uh, put the responsibility upon the central government if it is not their job. So, there are two major limitations of the um, uh, motion of tanks and the question here is also asked about one of the limitations of the motion of tanks it says that the name of president can also be brought into a debate as he or she is also a part of union executive yes the president is a part of the union executive but actually you cannot bring the name of the president during the debate of the motion of tanks which makes the option d as a wrong option yes i'm moving to the 81st question uh, uh, actually a similar question the same question the minimum support price for the agriculture i think we have discussed the same question in the as a fifth question the answer is about the minimum support price minimum support price is given uh, two committees are associated with uh, a minimum support price it is the commission of the agriculture cost and prices which recommends the msp and the committee of the economic affairs which approve the msp so here the question is asked about the recommendation which is Cost commission of cost agriculture costs and prices. Yes, 82nd is question is because see recently Minamata Convention, the cabinet has given approval in order to uh, sign to ratify the Minamata Convention. That was the uh, question and the. Uh, the question is the cabinet recently approved a proposal for the ratification of the Minamata Convention. Convention is a global treaty to tackle the disease caused by which of the following? It is mercury. Minamata Convention was formed in order to tackle the mercury poisoning. It is a Minamata provinces in the uh, in the Japan there, where there is a huge mercury poisoning leading to death uh, of a lot of problems even to the overall biodiversity that it causes a lot of problems. So, Minamata Convention which was signed in 2013 was ratified by India in 2017 and it came into existence very recently after the ratification of, of the major countries. 83rd question, an easy question, Competition Commission of India. It is a statutory body created to enforce the Consumer Rights Act of 1896. State number one says that it is a statutory body under the Consumer Rights Act. State number two says that the chair and the members of the commission are appointed by the president. See, both these statements are wrong because a national body like Competition Commission is a news. A Competition Commission is actually a statutory body but according to the competition commission act of 2002 not on the consumer protection rights act so the legislation is wrong the act is wrong it is a statutory body but not on the consumer protection act but in the uh, the uh, competition commission act the appointment 
of the chair and the members not by the president but by the union cabinet it is appointed by the uh, union cabinet um, and it is actually even was a news very recently because of the appointment reason the cabinet and the government approved the appointment of the uh, the competition law review committee competition law review committee was recently formed so the 83rd question also makes it because both these statements are wrong because it is not appointed by the president but on the advice of the vice president even there is a selection committee for appointment not by the council of ministers not by the president so both these statements are wrong moving to the 88th question is about national productivity council national productivity council is an autonomous non-profit organization as mentioned in the statement number one it has representation from the employees organization worker organizations only and function under the ambit of ministry of commerce and industries see uh, the only drastic statement is the uh, statement number two because it contains it it is one of the productivity organization because national productivity council is actually the indian subset of the asian productivity council that are formed in japan way back in 2000s way back 90s actually 1990s yes um, so it is actually a non-profit autonomous organization but working under the ambit of the commerce and industry ministry but it contains representative of all the three like it is actually a tripartite structure includes the government the employees and well as the employers not only the employees as well as the government it contains the employers the employees and the government which make the same number two wrong 89 again a current affairs but a very uh, history based question is talastamba dynasty Talastamba dynasty ruled among which of the following state from the 7th century AD to 10th century AD. See, uh, when you study the architecture part, we can see there's a gap in the uh, area of Azam as well as the Bengal era. We have the, uh, before the 7th century, uh, we have the um, Varman dynasty ruling the uh, and the, Azam, the wider Azam as well as the Bengal area. And we have, after the 10th century, we have the Palas, Pala dynasty in the Bengal. What in between? There is a reason in news because there was an architecture, there was a temple that found out a very unearthed recently regarding to the Stalastamba dynasty, which was actually ruling the Azam during the 7th to 10th century, between the um, which was between the Varman dynasty as well as the Pala dynasty. So a gap was filled up the area of actually uh, in the architectural section of the northeastern India. Because we have correctly in, right now in correct order, we have the Varman. We have the Palastamba and we have the Pala dynasties. So it belongs to Aza. Yes, question number 90 is about the uh, conditions. What, which I'm going to following is are the condition that needs to be satisfied for anti-dumping to be imposed on certain goods or items. The exporter nation provides huge subsidy in their country for a particular good, thus enabling it to be sold at a lower price the first statement is not anti-dumping it is the condition favorable for countervailing duty not anti-dumping duty what about the second statement the goods or items sold in the importing country at a price lower than the the price at which it is sold at the exporting country this is a condition that requires for imposing the anti-dumping duty anti-dumping duty is imposed uh, always important very recently particularly for the steel that is importing from the China so always in use what are the anti dumping duties who are implementing the anti dumping duties you all need to know about such kind of information this is the same question was actually previously asked in our uh, early mock examination we were testing how the students are getting into uh, how they're performing or adapting to the, uh, to the discussions and all and getting from the discussion so what the, we explain a lot of about the anti dumping duty at that pre occasion so 90 the, the condition that is favorable actually belongs to same number two which makes the answer actually p 91 there was huge struggle between the prasad bharati as well as the government regarding the appointment because the appointment for the prasad bharati uh, is always in the news because there is a selection committee because selection committee is appointed or the members or the to the Prasad Bharati is appointed by the president based on a selection committee by uh, which was headed by the uh, the vice president. So Prasad Bharati appointment is not made by the council of ministers. 
I have to be know, have to know this particular point because this was a point of controversy because uh, when the uh, during this uh, uh, February 2018 time there were controversies regarding the appointments give, made by the Ministry of Information and Technology because the cabinet the Council of Ministers actually give the appointment to the Prasad Bharati which is actually wrong because it should be it should have a proper selection committee and appoint, get appointed by the person itself uh, what about the same number one it says that statutory autonomous body which is correct and the chairman the tenure of the chairman is actually 70 years not 65 years so, so uh, when you're studying a particular body national body be it the constitutional non-constitutional body or the statutory body if there is a special mention of the tenure uh, the qualification you need to uh, get to it because the age of the maximum age of the chairman can be 70 not 65 which makes the statement number two and three incorrect the question asked is also which are the incorrect statements so the answer became b yes 92 is about prachi wali civilization prachi wali civilization is actually dealing with uh, recently excavated civilization was found from the pra in the prachi river in Odisha, it's believed and it is said that uh, there is uh, it is actually older than the Harappa as well as the Mohenjadaro. So there are problems, there are re uh, researches going on regarding the confirmation, regard the age or the time period of the Prachi Valley civilization. As of now, it is said that it is earlier, it is an earlier civilization even before than the Harappa as well or the Mohenjo or the overall the Indus Valley civilization. So the answer is B because the Prachi. Uh, civilization uh, um, on the river on the banks of the Prachi river in Odisha what about the 90 next question is about the 93rd question is about a fund compensatory afforestation act compensatory afforestation act was recently passed statement number one said that the national compensatory afforestation fund shall be established under the public account of India statement number two say that 40 percent of the total fund will be given to the national fund and 60 will be remain to the state fund these funds will be spent on wildlife protection and infrastructure development very important because um, for the past couple of years there was news regarding there are a huge uh, amount of like 50,000 crores of unspent amount in the campa fund so government decided to uh, make a legislation and to make sure that the campa fund is utilized and there's a proper management of the campa fund according to the reason early pass act we have established National Camp Compensatory Afforestation Fund Management Authority at the national level as well as the state level. Well, both these uh, authorities will have uh, uh, will go look into their respective funds. We have the National Compensatory Camp Fund as well as State Camp Fund. Both will be placed on the public account of India as well as respectively on the, the state. Well, public account of the India and the public account of the state of the state funds. What about the percentage of the camp? The distribution of the CAMPA fund is actually not 40 is to 60. 90 percentage of the total uh, the CAMPA fund will go to the state and only 10 percentage of the total will go to the national pool. For every project it will be like because of the statewide project there will be fund uh, associated for any particular project where 90 percent of the total fund given to the CAMPA will go to the state CAMPA respective state CAMPA fund and only 10 percentage will go to the national pool and we have the even the, the uh, what is the objective what will we do with the fund we will actually focus on the wildlife protection even with the infrastructure development the previously there were only focusing on the uh, particular uh, forestation things but even with the infrastructure development these funds can be used that is the major update of this particular act and which may be answer correct statements as one and three yes more about the uh, we have a couple of questions more again a question based on a uh, uh, council is a building material and technology promotion council building material and technology promotion council is a is a registered society and the societies act but under the ministry of ministry of housing and urban affairs this is the uh, primary uh, organization responsible for the management of fund recently created by the uh, government which is called the national urban housing fund national urban housing fund we have recently created fund that is national housing fund. that too we need to, we have a fund which uh, been very recently created because the national urban national we have the national urban 
we have the national urban housing fund exclusively created for the housing for all urban so in order to fund the housing for all urban by 2022 uh, the particular fund was created and this particular organization or the council is the implementing or the agency that's going to deal with the fund so you have to understand about this uh, particular fund as well as the agency it is a registered society but under the ministry of housing and urban affairs state number two is given as it is under the ministry of corporate affairs which is wrong so state number two is wrong the correct statements are one and three we have the 95th question uh, again uh, uh, ancient indian question uh, the group of singers and dancers visiting the royal court during the sangam age is known as because again as i said before the in the question uh, in the previous question we have some terms that specifically used to mention to describe some kind of people here again we have a group of singers and uh, dancers uh, singers actually at uh, dancers uh, during the sangam age is called viralia or panar panar are people that is used to uh, uh, call in the in the sangam age for the musicians or the the singers and the virali are, uh, are called for the dancers we have the panar 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 and the virali are so the uh, answer is actually d and we have other all the other three classification of from the sankam age itself respectively given the key regarding what are the classification for this other mentioned the group 96 service about uidai uh, is about a blue color atar an initiative led by the uh, the unique identification authority of india uni, uh, uidai which is the bal atar or blue atar it is an atar for the children below age of 5 years it does not include biometric information through fingerprint and its iris scan so it is actually a new initiative by the authority in order to bring uh, the uh, the proper registration of the children as well as to give them a aadhar card which is called a blue aadhar or a bal aadhar so children below 5 years of age can even access to get the aadhar card which is the blue aadhar or the bal aadhar it does not include the biometric information through fingerprint or iris scan both these statements are correct it is actually declared very recently about the new initiative um, it is very successful to uh, because there was news regarding the lot of young uh, kids who are registering as a part of even the excitement part of their registering for the getting the aadhar the biometric information is not required for the state but after the 5 years of age you need to give the biometric information what about 97th question is surya kiran military exercise is an animal military exercise between india and nepal makes it very direct question 97 c the by as uh, a by annual in by annual in uh, even actually not an annual event sorry the by annual event the 13th edition is actually uh, took place in the uh, month of february between india and nepal 98th question is operation greens was announced at the budget 2018 aimed at reducing the price volatility in certain vegetables which among the following are the main cause focus vegetables including the operation greens three vegetables are included uh, in total we have only three vegetables. Uh, operation greens we have the tomato we have the tomato we have the potato and the onion we have only three we have the tomato we have the pot onion and the we have the potato only three crops are actually uh, vegetables perishable commodities are declared under the particular operating grid by when the crude were given in order to reduce the price uh, volatility of this particular thing so spinach is not included which may be the answer one two and three 99th question is about bar drangam also was in news because bharat rank mahotsav is a national theater festival which is conducted by the national school of drama this uh, why this particular national school of drama or national uh, theater festival was in news because for the first time in the history international theater olympics uh, occurred in uh, was happened in uh, india was held in india during the uh, february late march time and the national school of drama along with the national theater festival is actually organizing this particular thing so it is very important to understand what is about bharat rank festival or the national school uh, theater festival it is actually originally national festival showcasing the work 
of the most theater uh, workers in India and evolved as largest theater festival in Asia. Both these statements are correct. The National School of Drama is actually an organization under the uh, out, as an autonomous organization under the Ministry of Culture was formed in way back in 1959. It's organizing the National Theatre Festival or the Bharat Rang Mahal Sir and is also the primary uh, organization which is conducting the inter which conducted which uh, made uh, the uh, International Theatre Festival in India a very success. Both these statements are correct. And the last question, 100th question is regarding the which of the following city is not a principal place of city of National Green Tribunal. National Green Tribunal uh, was established in 2010 as a, under the National Green Tribunals Act of 2010. Uh, it is mainly aimed at regulating the uh, green environment related things. Uh, what are the uh, various it can hold the power of various uh, uh, they can even call upon the people but it uh, not on the it works not on the principles it works on the principles of the natural justice not on the civil court procedures mm, the principal seating of the NGT is in um, Delhi and we have other places of principal seating like Chennai we have even the all the other options except in Kochi Kochi is not a place of or principal seat of of the uh, NGT. So the answer always became the Kochi which is the option D. So these were the questions of the art and culture and the current affairs. Uh, hope you have enjoyed it uh, and uh, very thank you all. So the first question we are going to discuss is question number two. Consider the following statements with reference to Emperor Ashoka Sri. First statement says, Ashoka followed a tolerant religious policy and never tried to impose his Buddhist faith on his subjects. That statement is completely true because Ashoka was tolerant to every other religion which was completely evident from the Lama Rishi cave which he provided to or dedicated to the Ajivika sect. Okay. And he also followed tolerant policy to the religious Brahmins and he even in his inscriptions also he was saying the same you should pay respect to buddhist monks and brahmins etc okay so that is true ashoka followed a tolerant religious policy and never tried to impose his buddhist faith on his subjects okay and then comes question number sorry uh, statement number two ashoka's political and diplomatic policies were always consistent with the views of kaudilya okay and kaudilya was a person who believed that a king should engage in physical conquest throughout his life and then that only made a king great but Ashoka's policy in his initial reign was com uh, comparatively similar to the policy of Kaudilya but after the Buddhist period after the embracement of Buddhism Ashoka changed his policy and he followed a path of ideological conquest instead of physical conquest okay so we cannot say the views of Kaudilya was completely consistent in the sense Ashoka's political and diplomatic policies were always consistent with the views of Kaudilya because after his embracement of Buddhism he changed his policy okay and the third statement Ashoka appointed Dhamma Mahamatras for propagating Dharma and Drachukas for the administration of justice in his empire. That's also true. Dhamma Mahamatras are the one who propagate Buddhism in his time. Okay. And there was also, there were also evidences that Ashoka sent his son and even his daughter for the propagation of Buddhism to Sri Lanka and some other countries also as Dhamma Mahamatras. Okay. And uh, for propagating dharma and rajukas for the administration of justice in his empire okay rajukas were a kind of official and they were in charge of administration of justice in his empire so the answer is d1 and 3 only question number 25 which of the following was a chinese pilgrim who visited india during the reign of harshavardhana okay as we all know Harshavadana, in the, in the time of Harshavadana, the Chinese traveler who visited India was Huenzang. Okay, Huenzang. And Huenzang was the one uh, who had some memoirs about the Harsha, Harsha's reign in that time. And his books are also famous in India. And the first option, I Singh. I Singh was a person 
who uh, came to Nalanda in the post Gupta period. Okay, he was in Nalanda for some times and he had some memoirs about Nalanda in that time. And uh, Pengao, Pengao is considered to be uh, in the time of Kushana ruler Kanishka. Okay, he came to India actually. Uh, Pengao is considered to be the one who prevented Kushana in uh, in some kind of attacks against his own tribe. Okay, and uh, as we all know about Fahia. Okay, and question number 26 consider the following statements about Nanda dynasty. Alexander invaded India in 326 BC during the rule of Nanda dynasty. Okay, it's true because it is Alexander's inversion time. That is the most believable date or the earliest believable date in Indian history because Alexander's inversion is mentioned in Greek history, not in Indian history. Okay, and Dhananda was the most powerful ruler of the dynasty and assumed the title of Ekarath. That statement is not true because Dhananda was not the most powerful and popular ruler, it was Mahapatmananda. It was Mahapatmananda who assumed the title of Ekarath and he was the most powerful king in the Nanda dynasty itself. So the answer is one only. And coming to question number 27. What were the duties of Rajan or king with regard to his tribe during Vedic times? First statement, protection of the tribe. Second, fighting wars. Third one, protection of the cattle. And the fourth one, offering of prayers to gods on behalf of the tribe. Okay. And the first three is completely direct statements and the fourth one will be the confusing one offering of pay prayers to gods on behalf of the tribe but the fourth one is also correct because it is not the brahmin it was the king itself was the one who prayed to god on behalf of the tribe because brahmins are considered to be the mediator between god and the people okay and that's why we are sometimes equating brahmins with fire because fire is also considered to be the mediator between the god and the people okay so brahmins was just a messenger and the king was the one should pray to god for the for his own tribe on behalf of his own tribe okay so uh, one two three and four okay uh, protection of the tribe fighting wars protection of the cattle offering of prayers to gods on behalf of the tribe okay it should be done by the king only okay in the rigvedic period okay and question number 28 in the Buddhist traditions, which life event of Buddha is represented by symbol of wheel? Okay. After the enlightenment of Buddha, he had his first sermon at Sarnath as we all know. And the first sermon of Buddha is considered to be, is indicated by the wheel. Okay. The Buddhist tradition, which life event of Buddha is represented by the symbol of wheel, which is the first sermon of Buddha. Okay. And Buddha's birth is represented by a lotus or elephant. And Buddha's death is represented by a stupa and enlightenment of Buddha is represented by a bodhi tree. Okay, so question number 29. Consider the following statements with reference to Chalukyan king Polikeshi II. Polikeshi II put a check to the ambition of Harshavadana to conquer the south. Okay, Polikeshi II considered to be the great Chalukya is the one who defeated Harsha in uh, in the greatest battles and who defeated Pallava also. Okay, Polygation 2 was the uh, one who defeated Pallava and Harsha. And Polygation 2 was the most famous Talukya king who defeated Harsha's army on the Narmada and checked his advance towards the Deccan. Okay, and statement 2 is also correct. Statement 2 says the eye hole inscription composed by Polygation's court poet Ravi Kirti provides account, accounts of accounts of his campaigns. The eye hole inscription of Ravi Kirti. Ravi Kirti was a minister and poet in the court of Badami Chalukya King Pulikeshi II. Okay, it's in Sanskrit language and all Kannada script. And it's a eulogy of King Pulikeshi II and his conquest, including his campaign against Karshavardhana. It is said to be that eye hole inscription shows the poetic excellence of Sanskrit in that time. It was that much beautiful and it was that much poetic. That inscription was that much poetic in nature. Okay. And the question number 30. Consider the following statements about the Sunka Empire. The empire was founded by Pushyamitra Sunga who destroyed Maurya Empire. It is true. After the death of Ashoka, even though we are saying that Ashoka's policy to other religions like Brahmanism was secular in nature, we cannot say it is completely secular in nature because some of his policies was not taken by brahmanas 
us good in the sense his policy of his policy of vyavahara samata and danda samata in which he ensures equality for brahmins and all the other castes in punishment and all the processes of administration was was a blow to the brahmins in that time okay so they considered ashoka as their enemy and the mauryas as their enemy okay and that's why a brahmin king pushyamitra sunga was attacked maurya and he was the one he destroyed the complete mauryan empire itself so the empire was founded by pushyamitra sunga who destroyed the maurya empire and the sungas performed several vedic sacrifices as they are brahmins it is should be or they should do the several vedic sacrifices in the sense vedic sacrifices okay because as they are brahmins they have to do their own vedic sacrifices and uh, they were good at that also okay and the third statement the sungas promoted the growth of vaishnavism and the sanskrit language okay and Sungas also promoted the growth of Vaishnavism and the Sanskrit language because they are Brahmins. They want to promulgate, they want to propagate the Vaishnavism and the Sanskrit language because Sanskrit language is considered to be the forerunner of Brahmins. In the sense, as we all know, the Buddhism and Jainism is or had their influence on the common people only because of their absence, only because of their uh, aloofness from the Sanskrit language, because they embraced uh, no, Pali and Prakrit, not the Sanskrit uh, literature and the Sanskrit uh, language. Okay, and then comes question number 31. Consider the following statements. Consider the following statements regarding the ancient Indian text. The Charaka Samhita contains names of numerous plants and herbs from which drugs prepared. And second statement, the Sus uh, Susruta Samhita describes the method of operating cataract, stone disease and several other ailments. Okay, Charaga and Susruta were the major physicians in that time. And the first statement which says about the medicines by Charaga is correct. The Charaga Samhita contains names of numerous plants and herbs which, uh, from which drugs were prepared. Okay, Charaga Samhita says about number of medicines in that time and it was detailedly explained also in Charaga Samhita. Okay, and in case of Susruta Samhita, it describes the method of operating, cat operating cataract, stone disease and several other ailments. This is also true. Okay, Susruta was considered to be the first surgeon of India in the sense sometimes world also okay so so the samhita describes the method of operating cataract stone disease and several other ailments okay and the state's third statement says ashtadhyayi is the summary of the eight branches of medicine written by vakbada that is not true because ashtadhyayi by panini is considered to be a grammatic book okay it's not about uh, medicine or physics uh, physics sorry in the sense medicine or biology okay and it is ashtanga samgrita okay or ashtanga khridayam or ashtanga samgraha is the one which is written by vagbada about the medicines okay so the statement three is incorrect because ashtadhyayi is a treatise on sanskrit grammar written by panini systematizing the rules governing sanskrit okay now question number 32 which of the following in this body sites had a dockyard? It was a direct question. No need to explain any of these things. It was Lothal and Lothal is very famous for its double burial. Okay, double burial and Lothal was a port city which is on the banks of Bogava river. Okay, Boga, Bogava river which is not existing now. Okay, and the question number 33. Which of the following rulers is famous in history because of the repairs he undertook to improve the Sudarshana lake in the semi-arid zone of Katiawar? Okay, so Sudarshana Lake, actually Sudarshana Lake was built by a man called Pushyagupta Vaishi. Okay, Pushyagupta Vaishi.
Pushyagupta Vaishi. He was the governor of Chandragupta Maurya. And it was first restructured by the man called Rudra Daman. Okay, the man called Rudra Daman first. And it was uh, secondly restructured by another man also uh, is in the list. And it is the answer is D Rudra Daman. But after the Rudra Daman, it was secondly restructured by a man called Skandagupta. In the time of Gupta era. Okay, and the options, the first option, Burhadrada. Burhadrada is the last Mauryan king in the list. And Karavela, as we all know about the Hathikumba inscriptions of Karavela of Oriza. And Puligeshindu, as we already, already discussed about that great Chalukyan king. Okay, and question number 34. Consider the following statements about Alexander's inversion of India. Alexander's inversion finds no mention in the Indian, sorry, ancient Indian sources or texts. That is true. Because Alexander's inversion is mentioned in not Indian text, it is mentioned in Greek text. Okay, and that's why we are believing it completely also. Okay, and the second uh, statement, Alexander's inversion paved the way for the expansion of the Maurya Empire in the Northwest India. Okay, this can also be true because after the inversion of Alexander, the Maurya Empire which was prevalent or which was uh, getting dominated predominantly in the uh, Gangetic Plain was aware of the fact that the western, the northwestern part of India is not systematically ruled and not they are completely strong or strengthened. Okay, and that's why they inverted uh, the Ambis and uh, sorry, the porous region, the Taxila region after the uh, removal or after the return of Alexander and they introduced sorry they, they had a fought with uh, Seleucus Nicator uh, governor of Alexander okay so the statement 1 and 2 are also correct both 1 and 2 and question number 35 which script was brought to India as a result of the Indo-Iranian contact in the ancient period okay and according to according to the historians there were different result or there were different results of for the Alexander's inversion and the first one is considered to be the Karyoshti scripts Karyoshti scripts arrival to India and other ones are other ones are the Mauryan sculpture had an influence of Iranian Indo-Iranian Achaemenian Empire Mauryan sculptures like pillars the pillars the pillars are firstly maintained or firstly built by the Achaemenian Empire of Iran and then as we said now the Karoshti script Karoshti script which was also the result of Indo-Iranian contact okay Karoshti script and the Mauryan sculptures and obviously Indo-Iranian trade Indo-Iranian trade These three could be the great result of Alexander's inversion to India and the influence of influence of Alexander's inversions. And 36. In the Mauryan Empire, who served as the highest officer in charge of assessment and collection of taxes? Okay. In the Vedic and after Vedic, later Vedic and after the Vedic time also, Mahajanvada's time. There were different officers who was in charge or different bureaucrats who was in charge with different names. Okay. And the one who was in charge of assessment and collection of taxes was Samahatta. Okay. It was Samahatta. Samahatta. And Sannidada is also another official who was in charge of treasury. Okay who was in charge of treasury. So, Samahata is the answer and Sanidada was the one who was in charge of treasury and Yuvaraja obviously the crown prince. Okay. So, question number 38. Consider the following statements regarding the use of gold coins in India. First question. So, first statement. The Indo-Greeks were the first to issue gold coins in India. Actually, Majority of the people or majority of the aspirants are thinking that it is the Kushanas who introduced gold coins in India. But it is not the Kushanas. It was 
the indo greeks who introduced gold coins in india for the first time and kushanas are the one who introduced indigenous coins okay or who was the first indian kings to issue gold coins in india okay and the indians acquired the craft of minting gold coins from the greeks and romans that is completely true because before that we were using the punch marked coins only okay and there was a large decline in gold coins post gupta age and a virtual absence after the 6th century which is also true because after that the trade laws after that the trade was comparatively or completely wasn't lost in india okay and the decline of the trade shows the decline of gold coins in india after the gupta age in the sense post gupta age so next is question number 50 question number 50 with the reference to the system of weights used in the indus valley civilization consider the following statements the weights were usually made of a stone called shirt with markings on them the weights and the seals everything was uh, mainly built up by the stones in the name of ajayit shirt etc in indus valley civilization but the problem here is with markings on them okay actually there were no markings on the indus valley weights okay there were no markings even though it was built in the uh, stone called shirt there was it was non marking one actually i think maybe uh, the lack of technologies or lack of techniques will be the reason but there were no markings in that okay and the second statement both decimal and binary number systems were used by the indus valley people that is true because for the less weight things or the more valuable and precious things they use binary numbers and the for more quantity things they use decimal number uh, sometimes for the metals like gold or ivory they may be using binary number systems and for the other quantity things other quantitative things they have used mainly the decimal number system okay and question number 51 regarding the rigvedic period consider the following statements the rigvedic polity was normally monarchical and the succession was hereditary okay and it was clearly mentioned in rigveda that the society was patriarchal in nature okay and the society was monarchical also because even though the king was not completely uh, powerful they had some limitations also but then also it was monarchical in character because king was assisted by purohita or priest and senanis and the their their uh, there were four assemblies mainly uh, sabha samiti vidada and gana okay so with all these limiting things king was comparatively powerful not ultimate powerful in that time okay but after the rigvedic time after in the time of rigveda in the time of later vedic time king became more powerful by abolishing one one by one all these assemblies and by subjugating the power of senani also okay and the rigvedic polity was normally monarchical and the succession was hereditary succession was hereditary but then also the the historians also says that there are traces of elections okay so even though the elections traces of elections are there then also if it is hereditary which uh, we can say the election should be between some kind of people it could be his sons the son of the kings okay and the basic unit of political organization was kula or family that's true the basic unit of uh, rigvedic society was kula okay and the number of kulas or number of families made the village or grama which was headed by gramini okay it was headed by gramini and the number of uh, villages okay number of villages in that time is named vis vis or jana in the sense which means the tribe and which was headed by a man called vishayapadi vishayapadi okay and question number 52 so the answer is 51 it is c and 52 the terms vrihi tandula and sali used in vedic text refer to okay there are some questions upsc always asking like this vrihi and there could be some other rigvedic terms like gavishti okay vrihi obviously we all know that vrihi is rice but there are also some other kind of words like gavishti in the rigvedic time uh, as it is a cattle based economy they used gavishti for war gavishti means in search of cows 
okay so they use the word called gavishti for war and they use the word called duhitri for daughter okay and all these things were something related to uh, cows in that time because it was a cattle based economy okay and brihi here is rice okay and consider the following pairs archaeological sites and present location okay and uh, first one gufkral and uh, it is said that it is said that it is in haryana but gufkral is not in haryana gufkral is a place in present day kashmir okay gufkral is a place in present day kashmir and chirand is in bihar that's true chirand is in bihar only and koldiva koldiva is not in maharashtra koldiva is in uttar pradesh okay koldiva is in uttar pradesh and buzaham as we already discussed buzaham is in jammu and kashmir only okay so the answer here is 2 and uh, 4 i guess okay yeah 2 and 4 okay gufkral is not in haryana it is in jammu and kashmir and koldiva is not in maharashtra it is in up okay and then comes question number 54 with reference to the taxation system in mahajanavadas consider the following statements the herders were expected to pay taxes in the form of animals and animal produce and the second statement there were taxes on goods that were brought on brought and sold through trade and the third statements the hunters and gatherers were exempted from taxation in the time of mahajanavadas nobody other than brahmins and kshatriyas were exempted from taxation okay so the herders were expected to pay taxes in the form of animals and animal produce completely true completely true the herders were expected to pay taxes in the form of animal sometimes animal produce okay and the second statement there were taxes on goods that were brought and sold through trade some kind of indirect tax okay the traders were never exempted from the taxation because they were the main taxing or main taxation uh, main source of income in that time so they never exempted the traders and they have to pay some kind of indirect tax in that time and the third one the hunters and gatherers were exempted from taxation never hunters and gatherers were also hard to give tax in the time of mahajanabadas okay and apart from this the craftsmen craftsmen people they were also made to pay taxes sometimes uh, through the product through their product and sometimes they they have to work in a month in the sense or uh, in the sense five to six in the sense five to six days in a month they have to work for the king okay that could be their tax in that time okay and question number 55 so the third statement is not true so it is one and two only okay and 55 uh, which of the following statements about the fourth buddhist council is or not correct okay it was held under the patronage of ashoka okay it is not true because the fourth buddhist council was held under the patronage of king kanishka and it was preceded over by vasumitra in first century ad in the sense 100 ad okay and it resulted in the division of buddhism into hinayana and mahayana set okay that is true because this is the last last buddhist council in which the total buddhism or buddhist concept got divided into two mahayanas and hinayana hinayana is considered to be the lesser vehicle and mahayana is considered to be the greater vehicle okay in which the hinayana ashoka the kings like ashoka and ajada shatru were the proponents of hinayana buddhism and it is said that buddha also taught the hinayana thing only or it was completely orthodox in character okay and in case of mahayana mahayana is something they are believed buddha as a god and they was the one or oh, they were the one who started idol worship of buddha also okay so hinayana is considered to be the lesser vehicle and mahayana is considered to be the greater vehicle and the division was started here and kanishka was the propounder of the mahayana buddhist sect okay and the third statement its proceedings were conducted in sanskrit even though all the other things of buddhism was getting faded and it was becoming more priest oriented then also it was the fourth council was not held in sanskrit it was held in prakrit only okay sorry 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 it's a proceedings were conducted in sanskrit and that is true okay uh, the last statement also true it is two and three only okay then comes question number 56 the only indus valley city without a citadel was chandudaro is situated around 130 kilometers south of monjadaro in Sint is considered to be the only city which doesn't have a citadel in the sense 
Citadel is the one which is fortified in nature. Okay, so the Changudara Citadel is not fortified in character, and that's why we are considering it as not a citadel. Okay, so uh, we cannot say there is no citadel at all. The citadel is not completely demarcated from the lower town, and that's why we are considering it as a no citadel town in IVC. And Changudara has a pre Harappan culture. Uh, in which we cannot say or we cannot see the mature harappan things like the complete uh, good drainage system the good infrastructure system etc okay and this area is very famous for the terracotta model of bullo cart and toy cart we, we got from the chanhudaro region okay and chanhudaro is the only harappan city which does not have a fortified citadel and chanhudaro was known for craft production including bead making shell cutting metal working seal making and weight making etc okay and then comes question number 57 consider the following statements about the later vedic period iron was used extensively during this period that is true because even though Rigvedic period also iron was known to them but iron was not extensively used because in the later Vedic period only major Mahajanavadas apart from all the major Mahajanavadas the smaller Mahajanavadas also started to uh, get iron or iron ore and they started to uh, take advantage of the iron ore mines in that region okay and they started to produce iron and they started to produce iron weapons and they started to deforestation they started deforestation and they started in some kind of better agriculture practices and some kind of copper smiths and other kind of professions also in the present in this time only okay and women lost their political rights of attending assemblies that's true as we said in the earlier question there were four kinds of assemblies Sabha, Samidhi, Vidada and Gana. Okay. And Sabha and Vidada in these two assemblies women were participated. Okay. And in the later Vedic period Vidada lost their importance and Vidada got completely abolished. And in Sabha women became not a part of that Sabha after the uh, Rig Vedic period in the, sum, in, the, in the sense the later Vedic period. Okay. Women got ousted from the Sabha only okay so women lost their political rights of attending assemblies that is true because Vidada is no more and in Sabha women are not permitted to enter also okay and child marriage became more common in the Rigvedic society some of the historians are considering Rigvedic society as an ideal society because there is no child marriage Rigveda says the marriageable age for a woman or a man should be 16 to 18 in the sense 17 to 18 okay so child marriage is not a common thing in that time and polygamy okay Rigveda also says about polygamy polygamy was also polygamy was not prevalent in nature but it existed in some kind of noble families but not prevalent in that time okay and there were not a sati and that's why it is considered that Rigveda is considered to be an ideal ideal society okay and then comes question number 60 okay it's a direct question Consider the following pairs terms used in Gupta era and its meaning. Okay, this Nagara Sreshti. Uh, okay, Nagara Sreshti means city head. Actually, that is not true. Nagara Sreshti is not the city head. It is the chief banker or the merchant of the city is known as Nag <coughs> Nagara Sreshti. Okay, and apart from that, uh, the Mahadandanayaga. Mahadandanayaga. Danda means punishment. So, uh, the Mahadandanayaga is the name given to chief justice of or chief judicial officer in the Gupta time and then comes Kumar Amatya okay Kumar Amatya which is the important minister sometimes the prime minister okay and then comes Pratama Kuliga Kuliga means craftsman the Pratama Kuliga means the chief craftsman in that time and uh, then comes Sartavaha Sartavaha it is the leader of merchant caravans in that time okay and all these things are clearly stipulated in the NCRT test and then question number 61 which of the following languages were used in the Ashokan inscriptions? Okay, actually Ashoka used four scripts and three languages for his inscriptions. Okay, and the four scripts were Brahmi, Karoshti, Greek, and Aramic. Okay, these were the these are the four scripts used by Ashoka: Brahmi, Karoshti, Greek, and Aramic. And the languages he used is Prakrit, Greek and Aramic. Okay, Prakrit, Greek and Aramic. And Prakrit can be seen as an umbrella language which includes Pali, Magadhi, Ardha Magadhi, etc. Okay, so 
Which of the following languages were used in Ashoka inscriptions? It is 1, 2 and 3. All the three languages were used by Ashoka. And option 2 and 3 are correct. In the north, northwestern India, Ashogan inscriptions were found in Karoshti script. In some places, Greek and Aramic was also used. Okay. And both Greek and Aramic have been used in Kandahar rock edit. <coughs> and the 13th rock edit, which is the one which gives details uh, about the war with Kalinga or the Kalinga war. And the pillar edict of 7 gives summary of his efforts to promote Dhamma within his kingdom. Okay. So, Ashoga's pillars inscriptions are very important for us to study the history of India and the history of the great Ashoka itself okay and then comes question number 62 consider the following statements with the reference to the pottery in the Indus Valley civilization painted black and red were was the most common type of pottery true because we know it is the plain pottery was more prominent in that time the painted black and red wire pottery otherwise known as the plain pottery was the most common type of pottery in the time of Indus Valley civilization okay and the Indus Valley pottery consisted chiefly of very fine wheel made wares as we all know in the Neolithic time itself we started to use pots and we started pottery itself but in the Neolithic time we used mainly handmade pottery not wheel made pottery okay and IVC was the first one or the first civilization which started wheel, wheel made pottery uh, so the answer is C so the answer is C and then comes question number 63 63 Anegananda Vada. Anegananda Vada is a core theory and philosophy of which of the following? Very direct question. Anegananda Vada, which is the uh, theory of relative pluralism. Relative pluralism, or uh, we also say it as many sidedness. Jainism says that truth is not single sided. Okay, it has many sides. Okay, in which it can be experienced from different sides okay and the complete truth will be get only after combining all the opinions or the all the truth we have experienced from different persons okay and that is the many sidedness of the truth and that is anegananda vada says okay and anegananda vada is the core theory and philosophy of which of the following it is and it should be jainism only okay that philosophy of relative pluralism or non-absolutism okay and question number 64 literary work consider the following statements and which of the above pairs is correctly imagined okay that is the question uh, Mahabhashya Mahabhashya is written by none other than Padanjali so that is true uh, Mahabhashya is a commentary on selected rules of Sanskrit grammar from Pandini treatise the Ashtadhyayi and Kathyayana's Vatika okay and Brihat Samhita, it is said that it is Bhairavi, it is not Bhairavi and it is written by Varaha Mikhira. Brihat Samhita has that name in place. It's an encyclopedia on architecture, temples, astrology, seasons, agriculture, max, etc. It is covered everything behind the sky. Okay, behind the sky uh, by Varaha Mikhira. It was written by Varaha Mikhira only. And the next one is Kadambari. Kadambari is a play written by Banabatta. Banabatta is considered to be the greatest ornament in the literary circle of Harsha Vardhana. Uh, it is said that it is not Banabatta who completed uh, the Kadambari. Kadambari was completed by Bana's son called Bhushanabatta in 7th century AD. Okay, and it is the love story of Chandrapida and Kadambari. Okay, and it was a great work. Uh, done by Banabatta and his son Bhushanabatta. Question number 65. Consider the following statements about Nalanda University. It was a Hinayana University. Okay. Actually, Hinayana University, in the sense, Hinayana sect of Buddhism doesn't have this much of academic things. Okay. The major achievement of the Hinayana Buddhism, the major academic achievement of the Hinayana Buddhism is Vallabhi and that is their only greatest achievement. So the Mahayana Buddhism is the one who embraces or who was the who was leading the Nalanda University. It is not Hinayana University. Okay. And 
and then next statement it was founded by kumara gupta one during the gupta period that is true because huen sang gives a very valuable account of the nalanda university the term nalanda means giver of knowledge and it was founded by kumara gupta, gupta one during the gupta period okay so according to huen sang it should be uh, kumara gupta one who founded nalanda university and the official language sorry it was a residential university where education was free that is also true because when we are comparing Nalanda with Odandapuri and uh, Malavi, sorry, uh, when we are comparing Nalanda with Vallabhi and uh, Odandapuri and Vikramshila, we could see Nalanda is the only residential university in that time. Okay, and in the Nalanda only the greatest philosophers, uh, we are calling them as Panditas, okay, who taught in Nalandas only, and it was only a religious, it was the only relig uh, only residential university in that time. Vikramashila is considered to be not a residential university, and some scholars itself says that Vikramshila is not at all a university itself. Okay, it was some kind of uh, academy, but not a complete university itself. Okay. And uh, Nalanda was destroyed by the man called Bhakti Arkilji. Okay, Bhakti Arkilji, he was the military general of Kutubudi Naibak. Okay, now not only Nalanda, Nalanda, Odandapuri, Vikramshila, all got destroyed in his uh, reign and in his inversion to India. Question number 66. With reference to the Shatavahanas, consider the following statements. They were also known as Andras. Okay, that's a true statement because in Puranas, Shadavahanas is also known as Andras. Okay, the successor of Mauryas in the Deccan are the Shadavahanas, and they are also known as uh, Andras in the Puranas. And the Shadavahanas followed a matrilineal social structure. Okay, and even though if uh, we are completely not clear about their system structure etc but from their name itself we can understand that it could be a matrilineal structure okay in the sense the names of the great kings the Gaudami Putra Shatakarni okay Gaudami Putra Shatakarni which says that uh, they introduce or they gave uh, more intro sorry more importance to the women in the society and it could be a matrilineal society then only they could be named as Gaudami Putra Shadagarni they are proceeding with their mother's name okay not only Gaudami Putra Shadagarni his successor in the name of Vasishta Putra Pulumai okay also uh, has the same character of his name okay and the official language of the Shatavahanas was Sanskrit even though uh, it was a matrilineal structure and it is not completely a Sanskrit society because even though Shadavahanas are uh, more prone to the or more closer to the South Indian regions or Southern regions then also they uh, didn't practice or they didn't influence the Sanskrit structure they uh, the their main language was Prakrit only okay and actually the Shadavahanas were uh, defeated by Drudradaman first uh, two times but after that after that defeat Rudradaman got some matrilineal alliances with uh, matrimonial alliances with uh, the Shadavahanas and then it became peaceful okay and 67 question number 67 okay which of the following cities was located at the junction of Uttarapada and Dakshinapada after the Aryanization the total Indian structure was divided into three the Aryavarta Uttarapada and Dakshinapada. Okay. Aryavarta, Uttarapada and Dakshinapada. Okay. And the and between the Uttarapada and Dakshinapada existed the great city of Madura, the Krishna's Madura. Okay. So the answer is Madura. It was between two uh, ancient Indian routes, two ancient Indian uh, trade routes, uh, Uttarapada and Dakshinapada. And uh, Madura is the answer. Question number 67. Madura is the answer. Okay. And the Uttarapada originated at uh, Pushkalavadi or modern Chaushada and went via Taxila, Madura, Kausambi and Varanasi to Padlaputra and from there onwards to Champa and Chandragedugad. Okay. And Madura was located at the junction of two famous ancient Indian trade routes, Uttarapada and Dakshinapada. This was because Madura represented the transitional zone between the Gangetic Plains, having settled agriculture and the sparsely populated pastoral lands uh, jutting into the Manwa Plateau. Okay, and then comes question number 69. 
Which of the following scholars were a part of the Navratnas that adorned the court of Chandragupta II? Okay. And the Navratnas of Chandragupta are... The Navratnas in the court of Chandragupta II or Vikramaditya are Amara Simha, Dhanundari. Dhanundari, as we all know, he was a physician and a writer on medicine, and Harisena. Harisena, who wrote the Allahabad pillar inscription. And then Kalidasa, the one and only great Kalidasa. No need to explain him. And then comes Kahapanaga. Kahapanaga, he was an astrologer. And then comes Shanku. And then comes Varaha Mihira. And then Varaha Mihira, as we all know about Brihat Samhida. And then comes Vararuchi. And then Vedala Bhatta. Vedala Bhatta. Okay. And he was a magician. And these are the Navaratnas of Chandragupta Maurya's court. Okay, who adorned the court of Chandragupta II or Chandragupta, not Chandragupta Maurya, Chandragupta II or Vikramaditya. Okay, and so the answer is obviously it is 1, 2, and 4, not Charaga. Okay, and then comes question number 70. Consider the following statements with a reference to the Sangam literature. The Sangam College flourished under the royal patronage of Cholas. Okay, uh, we cannot say it is under Cholas because the Sangam literature flourished under the reign of Pandyas only, not the Cholas. Okay, Pandyas, Cholas, and Cheras, the southern kingdoms, the main southern kingdoms are Pandyas, Cholas, and Cheras. And And if this is the peninsular part of India, we could say Pandyas here and the Chalukyas here. Sorry, not Chalukyas. Cholas here and Pandyas here. And here we have the Chera part. Okay. And Pandyas, uh, that area contains the Tirunelveli part of the present, uh, present day. And Pandyas were the first, or Pandyas are the major one who preside over the Sangha literature thing. Okay, Sangha. The Sangam College, college flourished under the royal patronage of Pandyas only, not the Cholas. Okay. According to Tamil legends, there existed three Sangams in ancient Tamil Nadu poetry called Muchangam, and these Sangams flourished under the royal patronage of Pandyas. Okay. So, uh, in case of Sangam literature, uh, we all know about the uh, poems and we all know about the books which was written in the Sangam age. And the second statement, Mani Megalai by Ilango Adigal provides valuable information on the Sangam polity and society. Okay, actually Mani Megalai is not written by Ilango Vadigal. Mani Megali is written by Sitalai Satanar, which provides valuable information on the Sangam polity and society. That is true, but it is not written by uh, Ilango Vadigal. It is written by Sitalai Satanar. Okay, and actually the Silapadigar, which is written by the Ilango Vadigal, is considered to be the prequel of Mani Megali. Okay, and question number 71. In the context of 
ancient indian history the term western satraps is used to denote a group of rulers belonging to okay shakas or skathians are the major reason behind the indo greek inversion of is said to be the major inversion major reason behind the inversion of indo greeks to india okay and after some time even shakas invaded india itself okay and they abolished the rule of parthians and they abolished the rule of bactrians in india okay and actually they uh, shakas rule in india was also divided into two uh, in the uh, northern part or the northwestern part which is headed or which is led by led from the taxila part and in the western satrapis part which is led in the maharashtra part okay and the western satrapi part which is headed by or the most famous ruler in that time it was uh, as we all know about shakas this uh, Rudradaman and uh, in case of northern one, the sense northern northwestern satrapis, it was god of furnace. Okay, and so the answer is B. And question number 72 consider the following statements according to Sankhya philosophy, nature and the spiritual elements together created the world. And the second statements according to Nyaya philosophy, salvation can be attained through acquisition of knowledge only. Okay, so there are six philosophies. There are six ancient philosophies in India or which promulgated in India. First one is Sankhya by Kapila. Sankhya by Kapila considered to be the oldest one. And the second one is Yoga. And the third is Nyaya. Nyaya. Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya. And four, Vaisheshika. And fifth, Purva Mimamsa. And six, Uttarami Mamsa. Okay, and in which, according to the early Sankhya philosophy, the presence of divine agency is not essential to the creation of the world, and the world owes its creation and evolution more to nature or prakriti than to God. This was a rational and a scientific view. Okay. According to the Sankhya philosophy, even though God existing or not, it is not the God who controls the total nature and it is returned by, it is done by around the 4th century AD in addition to Prakriti, Purusha, nature. Okay, in the sense nature or Prakriti is the one who controls the total system of the world and in the 4th century AD in addition to Prakriti, Purusha or Spirit, Purusha or Spirit was introduced as an element in the Sankhya system okay and the creation of the world was attributed to both it is the Purisha or spirit and the nature or Prakriti is the major reason behind the uh, order of the universe okay and that's what Sankhya said okay and the statement two is also correct Nyaya or the school of analysis was developed as a system of logic according to it salvation can be attained through the acquisition of knowledge knowledge means they are meaning the uh, five senses they are meaning the five senses okay in the sense Nyaya salvation through acquiring knowledge through five senses okay and it was uh, Gaudama is considered to be the propounder of the Nyaya philosophy and uh, Padanjali is considered to be uh, the propounder of yoga philosophy itself and Vaisheshika it is as, always, uh, as we all know it is connected and uh, Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa also part of these philosophies and these are the six philosophies of ancient Indian history and question number 73 which of the following is or are the reasons for the origin of Buddhist tradition in post Vedic India? And even though Buddhism and Jainism is considered to be social revolutions, uh, it has some economic influences also. Okay, look at the first statement rise of a new agricultural economy. Okay, in the sense, agriculture was predominantly done by the Vaishyas, sorry, Vaishyas only in that time, uh, all the other one. Brahmin, Kshatriyas and Shudras were 
living on the cost of Vaishyas only. Okay, so when they got some kind of economic upliftment, it was their uh, desire to get some social upliftment or social mobility also. Okay, and that was the major reason behind uh, the Vaishya. Sorry, the Vaishya people is moving to the Buddhism and Jainism itself. Okay, so rise of a new agricultural economy, which gave rise to the Vaishya community also. Okay, and the second statement strong reaction against various forms of private property okay the buddhist and jainist people were on a view that egalitarian society should be or egalitarian society will be occurred only with the buddhist and jainist philosophy because they were the only one which is uh, preventing the people from abarigraha which is preventing the people from possessing the property or sometimes coveting the property etc okay so they were thinking that the egalitarian society will be applicable only with uh, the buddhism and jainism and that's why strong reaction against various forms of private property okay and this could be seen as an economical thing also in the sense some of the people got more economy some of the people got more private properties and some other people which are not uh, richer when comparing with the others uh, it is uh, clear that it is completely okay that they are thinking like if they all come to our face or if they all come to our stage okay so it is okay for them to think so and the one are divided society also okay one are divided society as we said the social mobilization was not a thing which happened at the uh, in this time because uh, kshatriyas and brahmins were experiencing most of their privileges in that time but even though the Vaishyas are the major taxpayers they were not getting any kind of social and any kind of privileges in that time itself okay so the answer is one two and three question number 80 Jorvay culture okay a Chalcolithic culture is associated majorly with the prehistoric settlements of which Indian states okay Chalcolithic culture in which stone and copper were also used okay that type of culture is called chalcolithic culture okay and the jorway culture which was very prevalent in the states of maharashtra okay in the state of maharashtra only so jorway culture is a uh, culture prevailed over maharashtra in the time just before or just uh, before the ibc okay and then comes question number 84 with a reference to the Harappan civilization, consider the following statements. Harappans knew of animals like oxen, buffaloes, goats, sheep and pigs. That's true because Harappan were the Harappans domesticated animals after the Neolithic time. Uh, people got complete idea about uh, to whom domesticated in the sense uh, which are the animals they should domesticate and IVC people or IVC Indus Valley civilization people had a number of domesticated animals with them and oxen buffaloes goats sheep and pigs and actually sheep was the first one they got domesticated and then they went for cattle in the sense cows etc okay and harappans in gujarat had domesticated elephants that is also true harappans in gujarat had domesticated elephants harappans in not only in the gujarat part uh, harappans from the eastern part also domesticated elephants and the only animal which was not known to them was the only major animal which was not uh, not used by them was horse okay and then comes question number 85 which of the following gupta king is represented on his in his coins playing uh, the lute okay and it was a direct question playing the lute The Gupta period is also called the golden age of ancient India. Both Samudra Gupta and Chandra Gupta II were patterns of art and, uh, art and literature also. Okay. And Samudra Gupta is the one represented on his coins playing the lute or veena. Okay. And Chandra Gupta II is credited with maintaining in his court nine luminaries. Okay. So the answer is Samudra Gupta who uh, made his coins with his own picture. He playing a lute. Okay. And 86. Consider the following statements with reference to the status of women in Rigvedic society. Women could attend assemblies and offer sacrifices along with their husbands. In case of Rigvedic society, it was true. Women had complete equality. Women had complete egalitarian society in the Rigvedic time. But after the Rigvedic time, as we already discussed, they lost their political importance. They lost their political rights. Okay, They have been ousted from the Sabha and... Uh, the society sorry the assembly vidada which the women were a part was abolished in system 
okay so and the second statement there were women divinities in the rigvedic society who were equally important as male gods okay in the rigveda rigveda also mentions about uh, the rigvedic religions okay the rigvedic religions the most important god in that time was indra okay indra also known as purandara and which was followed by agni and then comes varuna etc okay and apart from all these male gods there were female gods like aditi and ushas okay aditi and ushas even though female gods were also present in that time it was never considered equal to the male gods so the male gods were the prominent one and the female god is considered subsidiary to the male gods okay so that's the end of the discussion thank you